All right, um, time to go. All right, um, I will talk about the public cloud and what we do from a SUSE perspective. So here's what, um, let's see, is there an echo somewhere? I'm, I seem to hear something. Is there a better spot on the stage? No? All right, all sounds the same. Okay, as first we'll start out, I'll just say something about myself, then we'll talk about some history. Um, we'll look at the public cloud landscape, and then I'll speak specifically about the stuff that we do, our update infrastructure, um, the images and the projects that we manage, and then I'll talk a bit about the challenges that we face. Uh, those are mostly internal. Come on, please. There you go. Uh, I've been with SUSE just over 10 years now. For the first three years, I worked primarily with IBM as a technical liaison, and then after that, I started dabbling in the public cloud, which then became my full-time job, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, I've had the privilege to serve on the OpenSUSE board uh, for three years, um, a while back, until Dollar Day Job took all of my time, and then um, OpenSUSE had to suffer. Um, and when I'm not in front of a computer, well, you'll find me in one of the breweries in Asheville. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, is, I've been living there now for two years. And it is the brewing capital of the United States. We have most, the most breweries per capita than any other city in the US. And if I'm not drinking beer, then I will be probably out on the road riding my bike. So uh, enough about me, some history. Um, so it all started in AWS. Uh, AWS is Amazon Web Services. Um, Amazon Web Services itself is about 10, uh, 12 years old now. And uh, you can see we published our first image, um, when was that? In 2010, on October 4th, uh, so just about nine years ago. So three years after AWS um, went live with their first service, which was S3, a simple storage service, um, SUSE had images. Uh, then in 2013, we followed up with, an, with image in Azure and in 2014 in Google um, Compute Engine. Things have changed, of course. Um, when we started, we had one image in AWS. Then eventually we had three, and it was all less, 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 less. Uh, today, so there were three images. Today, we manage over 75 images uh, that we release. Uh, that means when things like Spectre and um, Shellshock and those wonderful things happen, then we release 75 images. Um, that all usually happens within a day um, or two after the kernel gets fixed and gets released. Um, so, um, yeah. In, in the early beginning, there was an update infrastructure in AWS. It was a custom implementation. Um, now we have an update infrastructure that is comprised of roughly 250 servers and is cloud framework agnostic. And um, yeah, there's nothing. There, I mean, there's a few bits and pieces of special sauce, but basically it's based on our uh, standard products. Uh, we switched recently from SMT to RMT. And um, that went off pretty much without a hitch. Um, we had, uh, at the time when I started, we had one project in revision control. Today we have 25 uh, projects in, uh, in GitHub, um, plus a private repository with a number. That's a collection of tools that we use. And when I started with Public Cloud, we were one and a half people, so I was dedicated full time. I had Alex Osthoff as part time project manager, and today the team is 12. Uh, so you can see over the last seven years, uh, there's been significant changes. Uh, for, as far as partners are concerned, so we have the hyperscalers that's AWS, Azure, and Google. Um, that's ordered by size, so AWS is definitely the largest. Uh, cloud, public cloud provider uh, by any measure. Number of services, revenue, anything you want to throw out, uh, AWS is the largest provider. Uh, followed by Azure, 
and uh, then followed by Google. For these three hyperscalers, we built the images that are published in, in those frameworks. Um, we, SUSE, public cloud team, uh, we operate an update infrastructure and how that works, I'll get into that in a little bit later. And we have technical collaboration on various levels. So on my team, we work with these, um, with technical people on AWS, Azure, and uh, Google side. Uh, we have talks every couple of weeks where we have scheduled uh, meetings and then, you know, email pretty much daily. Um, and uh, we also work with these teams on, uh, on the kernel side uh, often, and I'll speak about that later as well. Then we have a new provider coming up um, that's kind of in between where we build images, but in Oracle, uh, there will only be BYOS images at the moment. And then there is a large number of um, quote-unquote smaller providers like IBM and VirtualStream and those providers that um, they manage their own update infrastructure if they provide on-demand images, they build their own images. Um, basically, they get a little help from us and other than that, they set free to do their own thing. Um, yeah. Generally, a cloud is no longer just infrastructure as a service, meaning basically you fire up a VM somewhere in the world and then treat it as a system. Uh, today, a modern cloud has services such as function as a service, database services, file system services, storage, you name it, it exists as a service and you can get it from them. AWS has the uh, most services, as I mentioned, the largest scale as a clear leader in Azure is second. Uh, Microsoft has a 30-year business relationship with pretty much any enterprise in the world, and so they're leveraging that heavily to um, uh, bring customers into Azure. And Google's working very hard to add features and trying to get a foothold with enterprises. Um, so the enterprise model that we work in doesn't ne not necessarily um, match well with the way Google has traditionally operated, and there are a lot of changes going on in Google to, to change that. Uh, at the top level, they all, you know, more or less, they have a web UI. You can go in, you log in, and then you can consume the services. And um, the, um, our partners are the primary driver of growth for SLES and for SLES for SAP. Uh, there is very little growth in the data center and um, you can, you know, this is all, it's nothing secret here. You can read all the information. You can hear it everywhere. IBM, HP, Dell, you name them. They don't sell as much hardware as they used to. Uh, cloud is where the growth is, and that's where, where we're seeing this as well within, uh, within SUSE. Okay, so what about our stuff? Okay, so everything we do, um, update infrastructure and so on. Uh, there are some other services we run is designed with scale in mind and with the expectation that it runs 24 seven. So when something, if we screw up or when we screw up, depends on how you want to look at that. Um, we are responsible submitting root cause analysis to our partners. So when something goes wrong, I write up uh, root cause analysis and pass that either to uh, Amazon, Microsoft, or Google. So when something happens with our update infrastructure, then we need to dig in and say what happened, why were customers affected, and so on, and then that gets passed on to, to the... And then we also have to say, you know, what is our corrective action to make sure it doesn't happen again in the future? Um, well, we get a lot of tickets, which is good, because that means people are actually using our stuff, um, but often they're also bugs, so that's not good, and then we'll try to fix them as quickly as possible. Um, but a lot of tickets are also just simply because it is a new paradigm. Things work a little differently. People use older tools that, that they shouldn't be using, and then they mess up their system, and then we get a call, and we get to help them to get it back fixed. So how does the update infrastructure work? So if you look at the outer um, outline and you think of that as one framework of a cloud provider, 
um, AWS, Azure, or Google. So again, this is completely cloud agnostic, could also run in OpenStack uh, or any other cloud provider. Uh, within the cloud framework, we have so-called region servers that sit around just in any region. Uh, again, everything is isolated, so if one of those goes down, it doesn't matter. We'll find another one and we'll use it. The region server has information about the update servers that run in each region. And then when the client starts up, it contacts the region server. And then the region server passes the update server information back to the client, and, that, and then the client uses that information then to connect to the update server. That all goes over HTTPS um, with um, our own certificates, and so everything is secure. Although in the public cloud, generally, it is very, very difficult um, to spoof the network because the network is in complete control by the cloud provider. So unless the cloud provider itself has a breach, uh, the network can generally be considered secure. Um, so in each, of the, in, each of, in each region, in each cloud provider, we run uh, three update servers. And, and as I mentioned, we just recently switched those from SMT to RMT. And um, these update servers share their database. So when one of them goes down, there's code in the client that will then fail over to another one in the same region with the same credentials. So the customer will never know whether one of these update servers goes away or even two. Um, the update servers are fully monitored, um, memory, disk usage, uh, you name it. And um, the systems admin team, which is currently two people in the public cloud team, they are on alert. So when something goes up, then they have to look at it. And this is basically 24-7 operation. Um, yeah. So. Our images, so all of our images, I mentioned currently we have around 75, are built with Kiwi in IBS. We have three projects. One is developed PopCloud. That's basically our play playground where we test things, we build new images, uh, you know, when something comes up or we test new packages. Often we also test the leading edge. We have a lot of packages that we link in from OBS to make sure that whatever's coming next is not gonna break us. Then we have the stable project. And the stable project is basically a mirror image of what we're building in production in the SUSE namespace. Um, but there we test, it, we test the packages that are in flight into SUSE. So if the initialization code changes, that then changes first in OBS, then it goes into the Vel project, and then from there we move the package into stable. We test those images, and then we submit the package back into the SUSE namespace via the regular maintenance process. And then the uh, production images are built in SUSE, SLE version, and then update pop clouds. So if you're interested in looking at the images and how they're set up, uh, that's where you find our production image setup. Um, images prior to SLES 12 SP4 were built with uh, Perl Kiwi. Uh, which is in maintenance mode, and in SLES 12 as before and later, so we, we switched over to the new version of Kiwi, Python Kiwi. Um, and there were some features added. And then as of SLES 12, we uh, started setting up multi-build, which is a new feature in OBS, where we can build multiple images with the same image description, um, which is uh, one feature that we need for the SAP container host. Uh, to make sure that all the images contain the exact same package version. So multi-build images, get the, the build gets kicked off at the same time, and therefore we get the same package versions. Or if we have uh, image descriptions that are separate, they get kicked off at different times, and then there's no way to guarantee in the build service that we may not pick up a newer version. So with the multi-build, uh, we can guarantee that an image, images for different platforms all have exactly the same packages. Uh, then we have various flavors of our images. Uh, so we have BYOS. BYOS means bring your own subscription. So that means a customer that already has a SUSE entitlement can go to a public cloud provider, start one of those BYOS uh, instances, and then register them with their existing uh, entitlement to SCC and get their updates that way. 
Um, BYOS instances are also easily managed with SUSE Manager uh, and SMT or RMT. And then on-demand uh, instances, so they have special sauce, and that special sauce is basically the cloud region server client, and that code handles the registration to the update server. So that code does all the magic of contacting the region server, uh, getting that information, processing it, and then registering it with the uh, update infrastructure that runs in the region of um, the public cloud provider. And the other thing about the update infrastructure, this region local, so traffic is, um, so there's basically no latency. Um, the updates are incredibly fast, and um, there's no cost to the, to the end user because all the network traffic is um, region local. That also means that as soon as the uh, user logs into the machine via SSH, updates are immediately available and super up just works, so, which is uh, really great. Uh, for on-demand, we get paid via the cloud service provider, uh, so the customer really doesn't have, if they're just using on-demand, really does not have any contact to SUSE. Uh, and support always goes through the cloud provider as well. So the cloud provider provides L1 and L2, and then our L3 team provides support to the cloud provider, and then they pass that on to the customer. Uh, the products we have today in a public cloud available that can be launched as SLES, uh, BYOS and On Demand. We have SLES for SAP, BYOS and On Demand. Then we have SUSE Manager Server and SUSE Manager Proxy Images. So those are bring your own subscription only. Uh, we have HPC Images um, for SLES 12 SP3. They are BYOS On Demand um, in Azure with a special RDMA driver that is out of tree. That is going away soon, yay. And then uh, as of last 15 SP1, we also have BYOS HPC images in AWS, and we continue to do BYOS and on-demand in Azure. Uh, in Azure, there are new instance types that use PCI pass-through of infinite band devices, and so we can get rid of the RDMA driver that is out of tree, and that makes our life a lot easier. In AWS, we're currently working with the, with the labs team to get the EFA driver into our kernel. Uh, a little bit more on that later. Uh, EFA stands for Elastic Fabric Adapter. Uh, and then there's an ENA driver, which is the Elastic Network Adapter. Okay, go. Okay, special stuff. So we also have specialty images that we build. So for, for Amazon, we build an ECS image, which is the Elastic Container Service. Um, the Elastic Container Service has an Amazon implemented orchestrator. So that is not Kubernetes, that is an Amazon uh, implementation. Um, those images contain, uh, are basically host images. They contain Docker uh, and initialization code that automatically integrates an instance into a cluster that runs within ECS. Then we have the container host image. Um, Felix already mentioned that. Uh, so that's basically a, a Kubernetes host. Um, we work together very closely with SAP on that. Um, but it's also generally useful for um, for Kubernetes hosts and we're currently working with the SUSE CASP team to see how they may piggyback on that effort as well. Uh, in AWS, the, uh, the image is released, and Azure and GCE were still working with SAP. There's testing, and then they will eventually be released. Uh, and then we have an SAP CAL image. CAL stands for Cloud Appliance Library. So SAP has a web application that they make available to their customers, uh, where, they cust where SAP customers can then um, launch specific SAP workloads, and, and under the covers, those get created on these uh, special VMs. And then we have a few others in the works. So, um, all of this is fun, but we're also trying to marry our enterprise lifecycle with yearly service packs and overlap support, extended overlap support, LTSS, all those wonderful complications with the expectations that exist in the cloud. Um, so AWS 
Amazon itself. They have Amazon Linux images. They have never deleted an image. Never deleted an image. So for 13, 12 years since EC2 existed, you can find AWS Linux images that are 12 years old. That obviously does not work for us, right? Because that would mean uh, SLES 10 would still be available if we would have had SLES 10, right? So the uh, image lifecycle that we've created is trying to address this problem uh, in that we're trying to accommodate what we do uh, in the enterprise. So yearly life cycles, and SLES has a six-month overlap period, and SLES for SAP has 18-month overlap. We're trying to accommodate that with expectations um, that people have in the cloud. Uh, so for Google and for Azure, we're actually managing that really well. And for AWS, we're still working with them to get them to understand the concept that images become outdated and they need to go away. Because in the end, we don't want people to launch uh, instances from images that we know have known security vulnerabilities, right? That just doesn't make any sense. So that is part of, of this life cycle as well. So we have uh, four states in the pint data, and I'll explain what pint, uh, not just about drinking beer, um, uh, but I'll explain what pint is later. Uh, so there are active images, and these images uh, are actively maintained, and they are on a three-month rolling release cycle. Rolling release cycle means if nothing happens between when the image is released and when three months are up, then the image gets refreshed, and then we go on. If there's a security issue in between, then that resets the clock. So then we refresh the image, and then the three months start counting from there again. So that's the three-month rolling re um, refresh cycle. And images that are basically the current distributions, which means SLES 12 SP4 and SLES 15 SP1, um, those images are on this active uh, cycle. Then we have inactive images. These are uh, distributions that are in LTSS or um, extended service overlap support. Boy, we got to sort out, out our terms here. Nobody can remember that stuff. Um, so SPAS and LTSS images are in inactive state. Um, they get refreshed only when there are critical security issues. So uh, Spectre, Shellshock, Heartbleed, we all remember those. Then we have deprecated images, and that means once an image gets deprecated, um, six months later it goes away. So that is the warning for users that, hey, in six months, that image will go away. Update your scripts so you don't uh, try to launch instances from those images anymore. And then, of course, delete it. All right. Um, yeah, so there's actually policy, which is at this link, and that's a blog. And uh, I just explained how that three-month release cycle works. So, uh, so, how do we get these state transitions from active to inactive, deprecated, and so on? So we have um, SLES on demand. So when a new service pack gets released, then the SLES on demand images from the previous SP uh, immediately become deprecated. BYOS becomes inactive because they then go into LTSS. And um, SLES for SAP also becomes inactive because they go into the SPAS period. Uh, when we have an image refresh, every image that gets refreshed or gets replaced immediately goes into the deprecated period. So that means six months later they get deleted. Uh, for critical security issues, all images get refreshed, active or inactive. And everything gets, gets refreshed, goes into the deprecated stage immediately. And for bug fixes, um, on-demand images are affected, and they get refreshed. And again, everything that gets refreshed gets uh, deprecated immediately. So this is the way we try to accommodate our release schedule of our products, primarily SLES and SLES for SAP, with expectations in the cloud frameworks. And we document it. And we're slowly making progress uh, with our users and with our partners to, um, to get this across. 
Okay, so now a bit about the projects that the team is managing. So Pind, um, Pind is a client server implementation to basically find our images in the various public cloud frameworks. Um, if you launch an image in the public cloud in AWS, you need an image ID. In AWS, uh, in Azure, you need a uh, resource locator. And in Google, you just need the name. Uh, so obviously, these are all different. And, and Pind addresses that. Plus, Pind tells you about the state of the images and when they were released. And as you saw in the very first slide, I also used Pine to figure out when we released the first images. So the Pine data contains every image that we ever released in any of the cloud framework from today backwards to the very beginning. And there's a, an ancestry where you can actually find which image replaced a previous one. Uh, the client is written in uh, Python. It's a CLI and implementation. And you, it's available for OpenSUSE and for SLES. In SLES, it's distributed in the public cloud module, and you can get it by super in Python 3 SUSE, SUSE public cloud info. On the server side, it's a Ruby implementation with a REST API, and it is running in GCE in production. Um, we have three varnish cache servers um, and a load balancer. So this is globally load balanced to these three varnish caches. Again, highly available 24-7, expected to never be out of service. Uh, the varnish cache servers naturally run in different regions across the world, so that if one region goes away, the others should still operate. Uh, we've not seen any outages on, on that front. Uh, then we have, we're working on image proof. Um, again, this is uh, Sousa Enceladus is the uh, organization where we're doing all our work. Uh, this is a Python CLI and library. It's basically is an image tester. And uh, the SLE uh, product QA team has implement, uh, has integrated uh, image proof into OpenQA. Uh, you can find some statistics there, OpenQA. And um, so this was really great, and it's really nice to work with the Sleek QA team. And um, hopefully we can, you know, going forward, we also want to work with the maintenance QA team. Um, there's another tool I'll talk about in a minute. So this was specifically designed to test our images. So it does rudimentary um, testing. That means we bring up an instance from a new image. We make sure it boots without errors. Um, we check registration for on-demand in instances. We make sure the image can, the instant, the running instance can be rebooted, uh, updated, and things like that. So basically, just a very uh, basic smoke test. And those tests are already built into image proof. Then Mash is a higher-level project. Um, it is a release pipeline, as you can see. It starts by downloading images from IBS and it can go as far as image deprecation. Uh, so all of this gets, is automated, or, well, the project is still ongoing. So we, we download an image from IBS, and we upload it to any of these cloud frameworks. Then the tester runs image proof. Um, then once we pass the test, um, it gets replicated. Replication is, of course, different in every cloud framework, so there's all specialist, specialized implementation. And then the publication, again, different per cloud framework, and then we do the image deprecation. Uh, today, MASH is only available via Trump host. Uh, so this is the architecture. And, and we, you know, if there's anything, we can insert a service in between. Um, the services communicate with each other via message queue. Um, there is an API server that we're working on currently. Um, and once that's done, the application will be open to the rest of the company. Uh, so hopefully when we get to that stage, we can work with maintenance QA and we can send a whole lot more packages through this pipeline to the end of testing. Um, so yeah, so the job creator receives a job document. Currently, that's JSON. Um, again, the uh, 
services um, communicate via message queue. The pipeline is designed to be self-flushing. So when a job fails anywhere in the pipeline, the rest of the services get notified and they drop that job so that there's nothing left over. Um, authentication is currently application specific um, because due to the, well, due to the very old single sign-on implementation that we're still stuck with from Microfocus and not having our own, um, we decided we didn't want to wait until we have our own, so um, MASH will get its own authentication for the time being, and then when SUSE IT provides a single sign-on infrastructure that we can uh, use, uh, MASH will be updated to, to um, function with that. The pipeline can be exited at any point, uh, so basically that means uh, we have a number of jobs that run just through the tester. So these are basic, you know, daily builds of images that run through the tester and run and run again. Uh, the pipeline itself is um, primarily bandwidth constrained, uh, so it's not designed really to be containerized because once you saturate the network pipeline, then, then that's it. Um, and um, we can, you know, there's also a scheduler built in into the pipeline, so we can schedule a job um, when we know, for example, kernel version XYZ has a certain fix, then we can schedule that job to be running when that kernel version is in the images. And then nobody has to babysit the job. So CVE fixes that need to be released on New Year's Eve at midnight are no longer a problem for us. Okay, um, so as I mentioned currently, only the public cloud team can use MASH because it's behind the chump host. Um, our next goal is um, to get rid of that chump host uh, with working authentication and then work with the maintenance QA team um, to hopefully we can start sending more and more updates um, through this pipeline and test image builds and test packages before they go out. Uh, recently, we had a couple of kernel releases that introduced regressions in one or the other framework, and uh, they could have been caught if we would have been ready with this tool. Um, MASH itself runs in AWS in a virtual private cloud network construct that is connected to um, the SUSE network via VPN. So on everything that we're pushing out, we get great bandwidth. Pulling from IBS does not necessarily go so fast. Um, and as I mentioned, MASH is primarily network bound. Um, for Azure, we have quote unquote large images that are 30 gigabytes and during uploading, we're checking for empty blocks so that we're not uploading empty frames. So that's where some uh, CPU uh, performance is needed, but generally uh, network bandwidth is our limitation, limit, limiting factor. Okay, uh, then another project that we ran in the, through the public cloud team is the SUSE Migration Services. Um, this is an automated, automated distribution upgrade, so across major service packs. Obviously, the cloud has no slot where you can put in the DVD. So offline upgrades with, ooh, insert the DVD and follow these three steps just to simply, they just don't work. Uh, so this uh, system was developed. Uh, we, build an, we build an image and um, we deliver that image in a package. And then there's an activation package that changes the bootloader configuration so then once you reboot, we, the system gets booted into the live image, and then we upgrade from there. Everything happens automatically. Um, this cannot replace the offline DVD uh, implementation, um, but it does fix our problem in the public cloud for migrating from one service pack to the, uh, from one major distribution to the next. Uh, for SLES 11, when when we moved from SLES 11 to SLES 12, I uh, ended up writing a hideously complicated, very long blog about how you get from point A to point B. Um, 
it's one of the most read blogs on SUSE, on the SUSE blog site. Uh, so this is stuff people people use, and and this is the reason we developed this for SLES 12 to SLES 15 to make it easier. Some other projects, uh, again, Cloud Region Server Client. That's the code that does the um, um, registration. And uh, it also provides a URL resolver plugin so we can validate every time a, an instance comes to visit us that that instance is actually valid to get updates. And then we have uh, monitoring scripts um, that we implemented specifically to help us with monitoring the update infrastructure. Um, all of this stuff is also, well, the Cloud Region Server uh, client is only packaged in IBS because it really makes no sense to have it in OpenSUSE, but all the monitoring stuff is also in OBS. Okay, so now you heard a lot of information where to get in help or you know find stuff if you're interested. So we have an internal wiki, um, which is just on our internal wiki site on the public clouds. There's a mailing list, public cloud users at suse.de. We have a confluence page and ongoing work we're tracking on the public cloud develop team Trello board. So challenges. Now it becomes more interesting. So for current, for the, from a kernel perspective, we have kernel Azure, which is a flavor um, that we agreed on to work with uh, Microsoft. Um, the goal behind the kernel Azure is that we move faster um, so that we can get features to enable Azure to do faster networking or faster disk I.O. or faster this or this new feature um, faster without some of the constraints that we have in our regular enterprise kernel. Um, in order to do that, we agreed that the Azure kernel can break the ABI uh, within a service pack. Um, and Microsoft basically gets whatever they ask us to. So they file a bug. Um, and Olaf basically puts it into the Azure kernel. Challenges that we have there is sometimes it's difficult to separate what needs to go into the Azure kernel and what needs to be going into the default kernel. Uh, it's not, the lines are not always clear cut. Um, the Azure kernel is primarily maintained by Olaf Herring. Um, and it is the default kernel that we install in the SLES on demand images. So when a customer launches an on-demand instance in Azure, they automatically run the Azure kernel, and we have documented on how to switch from one to the other, so from kernel default to kernel Azure or backwards. Um, obviously, for SLES for SAP, we have the kernel default um, so that we don't break um, the SAP certification. Also, what comes along with this fast and loose approach is that there's no LTSS support for kernel Azure. Neither do we support add-ons, such as kernel live patching, LTSS, and other things. They're just simply not supported with kernel Azure. So kernel Azure lives basically for one year, from service pack A to service pack B, plus the six-month overlap, and then that is considered dead and there's no more maintenance on that. And then, of course, we have the next one for the next service pack and so on. Also part of the agreement with Microsoft is that whatever goes into a kernel Azure in one service pack comes back into the kernel at the next service pack. Um, so obviously that is a lot of work in the kernel team, and um, you know we appreciate that for, in, in general, this all works pretty flawlessly. On the default kernel side, that's used in all other Im on, in all on-demand images and pretty much all images except for Azure on demand. Um, but we have at times difficulties on picking up new features. So we have the ENA driver, which is AWS specific. That's the Elastic Network Adapter. Uh, it's been in the default kernel since last 12 SP2. Version updates there are relatively frequent. Uh, it also goes relatively smooth, but it is not quite as smooth as we would like it to be, and so we're still having discussions on how we can improve the process to make this easier. Um, this driver refs relatively you know, frequently, as I mentioned, compared to other drivers that are in, um, in the kernel. 
Then we have net new drivers such like EFA, um, that's elastic fabric adapter, that's again, that's an Amazon specific driver, gets developed by the AWS Linux team. Um, for that, we, we try to follow the, the ECO process as much as possible, but it is at times tough going. So again, we're you know, trying to work to see how we can make this better. And recently Google um, created a request for us to pick up a Google specific driver. Uh, so we have to have more process discussions on how, how we can make this better. Um, currently, we still have, because of kernel Azure, basically we're favoring Microsoft when we should be Switzerland, right? We should be agnostic. We should treat all our partners equally. Um, and this is one place where we're not really doing that at, at the lowest level in the kernel. And so we still have to figure out how to do this better than we do that today. But it's not just a kernel. So in user space, we also have things that move fast or faster in the public cloud. And there are a lot of DBDK changes we need to pick up. Um, those are being primarily requested by um, Microsoft. Then we have Open MPI, LibFabric. Um, those are all needing updating because of AWS. And um, generally, those changes are too big for backporting. So we end up having to figure out how do we get new versions into the enterprise product uh, without breaking our promises to all of our other customers. Uh, so those are still challenges that we're working on. Okay. Um, you know, as an organization, we're still not fast enough compared to what our partners in the public cloud expect, and um, we're still having a lot of discussions on how to, do, to deal with that. And with that, look at that. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, blames? Hi. Uh, so, um, Anton Smorotsky, Sleek UA. Uh, the, co the first question, when you explaining about this uh, update server's infrastructure, uh, my thought was that actually CC have something similar, and what's the main reasons to have it separated and not like keep, like basically inside our company we have two infrastructures which solving uh, some, uh, somehow the same problem. Or I'm um, missing something. So the... Well, one of the reasons that the update infrastructure is designed the way it is is that it is region local. Uh, so customers get the updates from within the same data center or the same regions, which makes it incredibly fast. The um, DHA part of the update infrastructure for RMT is completely custom and was implemented specifically so we can meet the needs in the public cloud. Um, so, while SCC is much better than what we used to have with Novell, we still do have outages with SCC. The update infrastructure has no outages. Oh, okay. And another uh, question is regarding the migration tool, which yeah. you mentioned. Uh, for me, it was like somehow a surprise because my understanding is that usually in public cloud, people not doing stuff like upgrading from service pack to service pack, they just shut down the image and start another one. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> so so that, is a, that is actually a great misconception in the public cloud. Uh, so public cloud gives people the, the granularity that I'm going to say they always wanted. Uh, so customers do have instances that live for a minute or two, but they also have instances that run for years. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the SLUS 11 upgrade blog that I wrote on how to get from SLUS 11 SP4 to SLUS 12 SP1 uh, shows that. Had like 40,000 people read that blog. Um, and, and, we, and we still, today, now that after switching from SMT to RMT, there were some issues with SLUS 11, we still get emails and say, how do we do this now? Uh, so people keep their instances running for a very long time. Uh, and especially 
you know, slash for SAP, that's the same. It just happens to run in the cloud now instead of in the data center. So we have everything from minutes to years. Um, and even our update, in, I mean, our update infrastructure before we switched over to uh, RMT, some of these SMT servers were running for five years and we didn't touch them. I mean, other than updating and, you know, rebooting um, within the instance. But the instance itself was still the same instance than when it was started to begin with. But the fact that people is use it, using this this way, I get it. But your personal opinion, is it like normal to do yeah. such, such things in public, in clouds? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there is the... You, you, as again, you have every granularity that you need, right? As, as a systems administrator, you are very flexible of saying, okay, this, this is a system that I want to run forever. And um, forever could also mean I stop it every now and then, and when I need more memory, I'll just switch the instance type to get more memory. But it's basically the same system that gets updated just like it would be in the data center. And then you have those people that just say, I have a, a stateless application, and when the instance goes bad for whatever reason, I'll just start a new one and put my application in that and run again, right? So again, everything in between, from minutes or seconds to years, and, and everything in between. Lars. Yes, Lars, hi. Um, you said that Testing is not so easy because you have limited bandwidth to us inside the build service. Yeah. Um, can we make a deal somehow? Can we check if we can use, for example, edge cast or so? So we push out the images there and you take them from there or something like that? Uh, sure. Maybe yeah, we can, we, we can talk have a conversation later. about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. To Don't walk too far, Lars, yet. So I have a <laughs> comment. There was um, a statement made about a multi-build. Um, I believe that was not quite correct. So multi-build will not guarantee that all the different flavors will actually pull in the same images. That still depends on when exactly they get scheduled and whether any changes get made to the Isuzu project. Instead. It okay. just makes sure that you are building from the same um, Kiwi description without having to manually mirror it into different files. So when you do multi-build, the images, the image builds get scheduled at the same time. That's what we have, that's what we have observed. If, if the heuristic is incorrect, then yes, we have to fix that. On how many workers are available. Okay, thank you. So everything that you're going through, is that applicable to all the different instance types? on, for instance, AWS, et cetera, so whether it be T3, A1, M5, yep. et cetera. So it's across the board. If it's an instance host on AWS and you've got an image that's all going through that same process, yep. the same update yep. solution. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so as of, well, earlier this year, there's full support for A1 instance types in AWS. And Andreas is working on A1 bare metal. <laughs> okay, uh, anything else? Five minutes left. Um, so you were talking about the image lifetime. So did I understand correctly that you have like a library of um, each service pack release with maintenance updates that is not yet end of life available? for new instances to get created. Yes. Is that so far correct? Okay. Yeah. So, but that still means that customers, once they have launched a machine based on one of those images, they can continue to run that as long as they want, even if you delete those images? Yes. Or is there like some? Good. Correct. So those instances can run forever, um, but obviously they stop receiving updates because there's no LTSS. So after the six month overlap period, then customers no longer get updates. But they can certainly continue to run those instances. All right. Thank you. <laughs>